Yeah. Alright, so we have the blood, brain, and kidney. Uh, blood is 5,000. Brain is 500. And kidney has a volume of 200. There's a there's a drug or a or a uh, chemical that's being transferred from um, one compartment to the other. This transfer matrix has the same order as these three compartments: blood, brain, and kidney. So you can think about uh, it um, in this format: blood, uh, brain, and kidney. You have a three by three matrix that tells you how much of the blood is being transferred per unit of time from one, co from, uh, one co compartment to the other. Blood, brain, kidney. In the first row, we have 0, 200, 1,000. 0, 200, 1,000. Okay. So, um, the diagonals will be zero because we don't really consider any transfer from blood to blood. But at, u at each unit of time, and I, I believe uh, we are taking one hour as the unit of time here, um, 200 milliliters go from blood to brain. All right? And in one hour, 1,000 milliliters go from blood to kidney. In the second row, you have 200. That means in one hour, 200 milliliters go back from brain to blood. So it's going to be a symmetric matrix for this problem, except um, that there's no transfer of the drug uh, from kidney back into blood. And there's also no transfer of blood from kidney to brain and vice versa. All right, from brain to, so the, um, you have zero there, and then the last row is zero. So this is your transfer matrix. Transfer matrix tells you um, how much of the blood is being transferred from one compartment to the other. All right? And this is sort of effective transfer. There's, there's of course, going to be fluid trans being transferred back from uh, kidney to blood, but it doesn't uh, contain any, any drug, uh, so we, don't, we consider it to be zero. Yeah, okay. So there's no, there's no right. So, so these transfers um, are only um, the effective transfers. So, how much of the blood carrying drug is being transferred from one compartment to the other? So, in reality, you would have uh, 200. You'll have 1,000 going back from kidney to blood, but since it doesn't contain any drug, we'll just um, have it to be zero. All right, so there is this transfer back and forth, and there is this transfer, okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to write a MATLAB uh, function that will simulate this system. We, um, we have a starting concentration or starting amount of drug in blood, and we want to see um, the concentration or the amount of drug over time in each of these compartments. So what we will do is we will start with, um, let's say, I, I don't see the numbers here. Um, all right, let's start with 20 milligrams of drug in blood. Okay, And we will take discrete time steps. We'll assume that everything happens at once at one hour. Okay, In reality, you would have a continuous uh, transfer back and forth. Uh, but for this simulation, we will assume that the entire transfer happens at one hour. Okay. So at one hour, 1,000 of uh, sorry, um, 200 of blood goes into brain. 200 of um, blood comes back from brain. 200 volume. So 20 milligrams is um, the starting amount of drug in in blood. In at one hour, you'll have 200 of uh, the volume of blood being transferred from blood to brain. So we need to calculate how much of the drug is being transferred. 
okay. within that poly. Does that make sense? Say it again. Yeah, we'll assume that, that it's all being transferred at one hour. All right. Yes, the drug. Uh, the drug is diffused in blood and it, it goes into the brain with the blood. So the formula would be 20 multiplied by 200 divided by 5,000. So 20 milligrams is uh, diffused, um, is dissolved in 5,000 um, milliliters. And you are taking 200 milliliters out of that, moving it into brain. So effectively, this is the amount of drug being transferred from blood to brain. Make sense? Yes? All right. Okay, so we have, a, we have a formula that calculates the amount of drug transferred from blood to brain at one hour. And you would, do, you would repeat this for all the other arrows. But at one hour, we will consider that brain has zero, zero drug. <laughs> 200 if it is going back to uh, blood. So zero multiplied by 200 divided by 500, you get zero transfer of drug from brain to blood at one hour. Okay. And uh, for kidney, we have 1,000, which is being transferred from uh, blood to kidney. Multiply that with 20 milligrams divided by... 5,000. So this is the amount of drug that will be transferred at one hour from blood to kidney. Right. So how much uh, does this one make? Let's get rid of zeros. Um, so um, what's 4 divided by 5? Say that again? 0.8. Okay. So 0 0.8 is being transferred from blood to brain, 0 0.8 milligrams. And then we need to calculate how much will be left in blood. So this is going to be 0 0.8, this is going to be 0, and this is going to be uh, 0.4, right? Is that correct? No. Um, 1.6. Hold on. It is 0.4, okay. Um, is my are my calculations correct? It's four. Yes, good. I knew something was something was wrong. All right. So four milligrams of uh, drug goes from blood to kidney. Okay. So we had 20 milligrams in blood. Uh, four of it went to kidney. 0.8 if it went to uh, brain. Um, so we have 15.2 left in the blood. Okay? Make sense? All right, so now we are at time one. We have the blood, which, which has 15.2 milligrams. We have the brain, which has... Uh, 0.8 milligrams, and we have the kidney, which has uh, 4 milligrams. And the transfers are the same across the simulation. So now we are at time equals 1. Uh, this is the result. When we are at time equals 2, we will repeat this uh, process. Okay. So at time equals 2, we'll have from here, a transfer into brain. So we'll have 15.2 multiplied by 200, um, sorry, this 200, divided by 5,000. So 200 milliliters out of 5,000 is going from blood to brain, and you multiply it with the amount of drug in blood, and this will give you how much will be transferred at time equals 2. Is 
Is it 6.8? Uh, no, um, 0 0.68? 0 0.68? 0 0.61. 0.61. Okay, um, so this is going to be 0 0.61. And this arrow is going to be 15.2 multiplied by 1,000 divided by 5,000. Okay? And that's going to be 3.4. No, it's going to be 3.04. Is that correct? Okay. All right. So we have 3.04 going from blood to kidney, uh, 0.61 going from blood to brain. Now we have to calculate what's going to be left in brain, but there's one more arrow that we need to consider, and that is uh, the one back from brain. And that one is going to transfer 0.8, which is the amount that's uh, currently in brain, multiplied by uh, 200, which is the amount being transferred, divided by 500, which is the volume of the brain. Okay? And that's going to give us um, 3.2. Right? Okay, so we have 60.61 going into brain, 0.32 coming back from brain, and 3.04 going into kidney. So the end uh, amount of drug that will be left in blood is going to be 15.2 minus 0.61 uh, plus 0.32 minus 3.04. Make sense? Yeah, there's no uh, blood comes back, but there's no drug with it, so it's gonna be zero. Okay. Blood come uh, yeah, drug comes back from brain with the blood. Okay. So this is gonna be the new concentration um, that you're going to use when um, when it's time equals three. And we're going to repeat this process over and over uh, for a certain number of time steps. And then we will plot the concentration of drug in each of these compartments. So for brain, we started from 20, and it, it will decrease over time. Uh, the amount of blood drug in kidney will increase over time. And the one in the brain is going to increase and then decrease. So we are trying to see this uh, effect through simulation. Make sense? All right. All right, and I'm going to rename these metabolites. Let's call C1 to be A and uh, C2 to DB. So we have the initial concentration, 700, 500. We'll store that in a vector. And we have the um, transfer matrix from A to B. There's no transfer from A to A. There's no transfer uh, from uh, B, to, B to B. From A to uh, B, we have 0.5, which is the ratio um, of A being transferred in one minute. And from B to A, we have uh, 0.3. And we will write a for loop that will go minute by minute and simulate this problem. Transfer matrix is um, 0, 0, 0.5 and 0, 0.30. It's a 2 by 2 matrix giving us the transfer from A to B and then B to A. Our initial concentrations, let me store in a vector called initials. We have 700 for A and 500 for B. 
All right. So uh, at one minute, let's try to figure out how much of A is going to be transferred into B and how much of B is going to be transferred into A. Uh, so you would just take this transfer matrix and multiply it with this uh, initials, right? So we have this matrix. Uh, and let me imagine uh, we have other, other entities, B, C, D. So let's work on a general case, and then we will reduce it back to a 2 by 2 matrix. B, C, D. And the diagonals are 0, but they don't have to be. And we have numbers here. Um, so this is the transfer matrix. What you need to do is you need to take 700 and multiply it um, for this row, right? So if you'll multiply 700 with this number, it'll tell you how much of 700 goes into B. When you multiply 700 with C, you get um, how much of A is going to be transferred into C. So you're multiplying 700 uh, for each column in the first row. So what the, the um, if you wanted to do a single matrix multiplication, um, a reasonable thing to do would be to replicate that 700 over and over so you have the same number of columns here and the same number of columns in the other matrix. And you would take the second um, entity and do the same thing. Third one, if you had a third one, you would do the same thing. And then we will do element-wise multiplication that will give us how much of um, each of these metabolites is being transferred to the other metabolite. Make sense? All right, now let me, let me go back to a 2 by 2 matrix. We have point, uh, point 0.5 and point 0.3. And we'll multiply that with 700, 700, 500, 500, and we'll do element-wise multiplication. So that's 0, uh, 700 times uh, 0.5, um, 350, 500 times uh, 0.3, is 150 and zero. Okay, so that's the that's the amount being transferred from one compartment to the other. So what this means um, from the so you have a source and you have a destination, right? This 350 will leave A and go into B. All right. So if you when you are trying to calculate a new value for A you need to subtract 350. When you are tr trying to calculate a new value for B, you would be adding 350. And for 150, it's going um, into A, so you are, you'll be adding it to A. It's coming from B, you would be subtracting it from B. Make sense? Yes? All right. So this first row, is what's leaving A. If you had more than two columns, you would just take the sum of all, and that's going to give you how much is leaving A. So uh, let's have the variable A, which has 700 at the moment. We'll just say A equals A plus, sorry, A minus, it's going to leave um, the sum of, let me call this matrix T. T first row. Okay. Plus anything that's in the first column tells you how much is moving back into A. So you will do sum. T colon comma one. All right. So these are the ones that are leaving A, and this is what's coming back into A. And you update A, store it back in that. 
Make sense? All right. Um, you will do the same thing for B. Okay. Um, it's convenient to have a matrix for A and that contains, or a vector that contains A and B, and just do a matrix operation. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can write a for loop um, where you would do it for the first uh, element, which is A, and then for the second element, which is B. If you uh, don't feel comfortable with uh, a for loop, you would have to do once for A and then do it once for B. Okay. So you can do it, uh, you can repeat the, these, um, this code for A and then B and then however many entities you have if you don't want to write uh, a matrix operation or a for loop. So let this, let's do this in MATLAB. Um, let's do it just once. So we'll do initials. We'll replicate it. Um, and I'll, I'll just do it for general case. Um, size. So we want to repeat it. We want to make sure that this is a column matrix. And then we will replicate it once along the rows and um, size of transfer. Here, let me write an N, which is going to be the number of entities, numeral initials. In this case, it's going to be two, uh, but this, the expressions uh, below this line will work for any number of entities. Okay. Um, and so this is going to replicate the concentrations um, as the number of columns I have. And then I will dot multiply it with the transfer, which is the ratio uh, of, trans the ratio, uh, of uh, these chemicals being transferred. Um, is it supposed to be replicated by the number of columns initials? Because it's going to be the same size. Right? Yeah, so, um, this n is is equal to two, right? Yeah. Initials is going to be seven hundred and five hundred. Transfer is going to be zero zero point five zero point three zero. I want to take this and make it the same size as the transfer. So I want to get this as a result: seven hundred, seven hundred, five hundred, five hundred. So if initial is a block, I want to replicate it um, along the columns twice and along the rows once. So I don't replicate it along the rows, but have another copy of it, copy of it um, along the columns. So for this case, it works. But what happens if the transfers are more matrix-based? So the assumption is that your transfer uh, matrix will have a row, it's going to be a square matrix, and it will have a row and column for each entity you have. Okay. All right. If initials, um, um, if you have, so you, you may assume that uh, for, if you have less initials, you can pad them with zero, but for our problems that uh, I'm giving you, we always, we always give you the initials um, for all the ent entities that you have. All right. So the number of initials will always equal to the number of rows and number of columns in transfer. Because you, you want to have a value for transferring from each compartment to the other. And for some of them, it may be zero. All right, so this expression will give me uh, the actual amount or the actual concentration being transferred uh, from uh, one entity to the other. And it will give me a matrix, right? Sorry. This is going to give me a matrix that says 700 multiplied by 0 0.5, sorry, uh, multiplied by 0, 700 multiplied by 0 0.5, 500 multiplied by 0 0.3, and 500 multiplied by 0. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sum of this matrix um, along each row. So I want to find the sum of the first row, 
and the sum of the second row. Sum function can take a matrix and generate this vector for you, so you don't have to do it one by one. If you look at the documentation for sum, let me call this uh, matrix T. You say sum T, and then it can take a second uh, optional argument, and in this case we're going to give two, which says you want to sum up each row and get a column matrix as a result. So this will give you this expression will give you this vector, where each element is the sum along each row. Make sense? Yes. So the sum function has an additional um, second argument that gives you the, the dimension along which you want to sum up. So if you have a matrix, um, you, there, are, there are actually three options for summing in a, in a matrix. You may be interested in summing all of the elements and get a single number, right? So you want to get a single number. You may want to sum along each row and get a column vector. You may want to sum up along each column and get a row vector. So those are three different um, three different common ways of summing up a, a matrix. The sum function takes an extra argument where you can specify which one. It actually, you will only be able to specify either a row vector or a column vector, and the third one I'll show you how to do that. Um, so if you want to get a row vector uh, whose elements are the sums of columns, then this number would be one. If you want to get a column vector where each element is the sum along a row, then you would provide this number too. And you can experiment with it uh, just in the command window, um, have a random matrix and call sum function to see what you get. And the default is going to be one. So if you don't provide uh, a second argument to the sum function, it will assume that you are getting a row vector as a result. So you will take the summation along columns. When you want to sum a matrix along, um, like in its entirety and get a single number, you should first linearize it and then take the sum. So one way of doing that is to say sum t parenthesis colon. So this will linearize it and then you are taking the sum of a linear vector, it will give you a single number. Another way is to say sum, sum t. So the inside sum is going to give you a row vector, and then you are taking the sum of that again to get a single number. Okay. All right. So this uh, column vector is the amount transferred from each metabolite. And when you do the um, summation along columns, that will be the amount of metabolite going into each metabolite. Make sense? Yes? All right. So this first row is going to, the sum of the first row is going to tell you how much A is losing. First column is going to tell you how much A is gaining. Second row is telling you how much B is losing. Second column is telling you how much B is gaining, how much is coming back into B. All right? So if I take this vector, I would subtract it from initials, right? So the first element will be subtracted from 700 to get uh, a new value for A, and the second value is going to be subtracted from 500 to get a new value of B. Additionally, I will add this uh, row vector, which is the sum along columns, uh, to get the final values. Make sense? All right. So let me call this matrix T. Sum of T, comma 2, is how much each uh, metabolite is losing. So initials equals initials minus that, and then plus sum 
along the columns is how much each uh, metabolite is gaining. And this is the formula that will give you uh, the final amount for each metabolite for just one time step. So let's run this and see what happens. Um, F9, so transfer is a 2 by 2 matrix. And then let me highlight this red mat to show you what the result is. Uh, I get a 2 by 2 matrix where I just replicate um, the initial values, multiply it with the uh, transfer. That gives me the amount being transferred um, from each metabolite to the other metabolite. Sum along the rows. Um, oh, let me calculate this. Sum along the rows uh, tells me how much each metabolite is losing. Sum along the columns tells me how much each metabolite is gaining. What I will do, I will just subtract uh, the losses from and, and add up the gains. Um, but I need to make sure that uh, everything is uh, has the right right dimension. So initials is a column vector. This one will be a column vector. But the last one, I'll just I'll just take the transpose. Okay. Let's repeat this. F9. Um, we get 500, 700. Okay. Yes. All right. So how how I highlight it and play it? Uh, usually, what people do is you highlight, you uh, hit Control C, and then you go into the command window and hit Control V. Uh, some people have figured out that they ha they can click right click, and uh, say evaluate selection. And other people have figured out that when you right click, it tells you the shortcut, which is F9 on Windows. On Macs, it may be different. So you highlight and hit F9, it'll, it'll just do the copying, pasting into the command window and hitting enter. Okay, sure. All right. Um, okay, so this is just one iteration. So this is after one minute. Okay, after one minute, we have 500 metabolite A and 700 metabolite B. We're going we're gonna to iterate this over and over. Okay, so, uh, but what we do is not going to change. We will again calculate... Uh, the, this transfer matrix, the, the amount being transferred, and we'll update um, the concentrations. Actually, I should probably not name it initials because uh, it's no longer initials, but it's at time um, time one. Now we are at time two. At time two, the transfer matrix, uh, the amount being transferred is going to be this, 0, 250, 210, 0. And then when we update uh, the concentrations, we get 460 and 740. And when we iterate again, I'm just highlighting and uh, hitting F9. And that, we have 452, 748. Highlight again, that's how much is going to be transferred. And that's the next um, set of values, the next set of concentrations uh, that I have. So now we don't want to... Um, do this over and over. So you don't want to say copy, paste, and repeat that, let's say, 10 times. What you want to do is have a for loop that will do it for you. For i equals, let's say, 1 to 100. We're going to iterate this 100 steps. Let me um, highlight this over again, the entire thing. So after 100 steps, we have 450a and 750b. Uh, All right. Um, when we want to plot, we actually want to keep track of the concentrations over time. So we don't just want to store it in a single variable. We want to store it, uh, let's say, in a mat matrix that will keep track of these concentrations over time. Uh, let me call this variable history. So at time 0, we have 700, 400. Mm. 
Now, uh, instead of um, instead of replacing the entire history, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new um, column to it. I wanted to say a new row, but uh, the way that I set up this um, history variable is it's a single column vector. So what I'm going to do, each uh, time point is going to add a new column to this uh, history matrix. So what I want to get is something like the following. So at time zero or um, time equals one, um, whatever uh, you want to call the first time point, we have 700, 500, and after one iteration we have 500, 700. So this is t equal one, t equals two, so I should say t equals zero, t equals one, t equals two, and so on. So I want to fill in the, these values for all the way to time equals 100. Okay. All right, so in my for loop, um, this time value is going to be my loop index. And then these numbers, will will be able to calculate them from the previous column. So the previous column will, ha will contain the last concentrations before that time point. And then you will calculate the new transfer uh, amounts based on that column and fill in values for the next column, for uh, t equals 1. When t equals 2, we'll take t equals 1 and use it to fill in the next column and so on. Okay? All right. Let me rename this um, loop variable to be t um, for time and should I already have a t variable. Let's, let's keep it as i. Um, let me call this trend. So trend is the amount being transferred at that time point, and transfer matrix is the ratio that's going to be transferred at any time point. So what we'll do is say t plus one. Um, colon t plus 1 equals the concentrations at the previous time point and then this one also needs to be calculated from the previous time point okay all right so I'm taking the um, previous time points concentrations which is the column T, and use them to store new values in the T plus first column in my history matrix. <clears throat> Make sense? Yes? All right, so let's run this and see what we get in our history matrix. F9, F9, and um, I'll just take a look at the first few columns, um, 1 to 10. Right. So we start off with 700, 500, and then it goes to 500, 700, and then so on. Okay. Same numbers as when I did the, iter when I did the simulation um, um, by hand or individually one by one. And now I, I'm collecting all of those numbers in a single matrix where I keep track of the concentrations over the course of the simulation. Now that I have these concentrations, I can plot them using the plot function. All right. The way that plot function works is you provide x coordinates and y coordinates separately, which uh, sometimes is not very natural. Uh, for instance, when you have, let's say, the PDB coordinates, uh, you have x, y, z coordinates. It's a um, three-column matrix you would naturally want to be able to provide that three column matrix and say plot, but it doesn't work that way. You have to provide the first column as X, second column as Y, and the third column as Z. Um, so plot function expects you to give X coordinates and Y coordinates separately. Our X coordinates are just, are just going to be the time points, right? It's going to be the zero time point, or, uh, or it's going to be the first time point, second time point, all the way to 100th time point. So let's do zero. Um, we should probably do 
this because um, there is one extra in my history. The first uh, column is actually the zeroth uh, time point. All right, so those are going to be my x coordinates. My y coordinates are going to be this first row, which is going to give me the concentrations of A. History, uh, first row, all columns. Let's plot that. So you get the concentrations of A over time. We'll do the same thing for 2, and we get the concentrations of uh, B over time. My time course is too long, that's why we see a large jump at the beginning of the plot, and then it, it uh, flattens off after that. Um, so what we'll do is change this time point to, let's say, something more reasonable so we can see the change to time um, t equals 20. Let's hit F5 to get the new history, new plot, uh, but now I, I'm going to go all the way to 21. All right. Even 20 is too large. Uh, let's go all the way to 10. F5. The concentration of A over time. When you want to plot multiple things, you would say hold on. And uh, so that, that was concentration of B. And then we'll plot the other one. Because every time you call the plot function, it would normally erase your plot and start over from scratch. You actually, you, what you want to do is keep the previous plot and uh, add your new one on top of the first one. And this hold on command uh, keeps the first one in place so you can draw the next one up. All right. Um, you can, instead of doing that, you can combine all of your series that you would like to plot in a single call to the plot function. So you will uh, provide x, y, and then the second set of x, y values. What did I do? Um, my, oh, that's a semicolon. Okay, thanks. Um, but now I should I should either do hold off or say CLF. To clean up to clean up what I had before so a clear figure will clean up the figure and do plot again uh, each series will be plotted with a different color and that's uh, what you want to get and you can add a legend that uh, tells you which one is which a and B as a cell array of strings and you get this legend in your plot that tells you the blue one is a and the green one is B uh, let's take a short break and then we'll continue um, by converting this solution to a structure solution. All right, now we're going to collect the name. Is this on? It keeps going on and off. It's off now, right? It doesn't work. It's gone? Maybe out of battery. Oh. I'll move it up. I like hearing my echo. Um, all right, so we're going to have a state variable. Let's call it S. And we'll store the transfer and the initial concentration or the concentration at any time into this state variable S. So S.transfer is going to be equal to that. And S.concentrations is going to be equal to that. Those are our, that's my initial concentrations, and that's the uh, transfer matrix. I'm going to take this uh, row that calculates, um, actually this, these two rows, um, and move it into a separate function that calculates um, the next state.
Let me give this function a name. The MATLAB doesn't complain to me that I have multiple functions in a in a script. Function get next state. So this function get next state is going to get um, a, the current state, and it will return the updated concentrations. Uh, it will return a new state with the updated concentrations. So we'll do something very similar to what we do here, um, calculation-wise, but we'll store it in a different uh, way. So let's return this uh, s, let's call this new s, new state. All right, let me copy and paste this, these two rows here, and then I'll modify them. Again, the transfer is going to be the calculated from the concentrations, but now I don't have a matrix, it's just a vector, <coughs> multiplied by the transfer matrix, and then the new state, the concentrations in the new state are going to be calculated from the concentrations from the previous state. It's no longer a matrix, and the rest is the same. Okay? All right. Uh, when you have a function within another function, um, MATLAB will highlight some of these variables, uh, the variables that have the same name between the two functions, just to uh, give you a warning that uh, they have the same name but they are actually different variables because these are two separate functions. Now I'm going to change this for loop because I no longer need um, this calculation. It's going to be performed in the get next state. Um, so let's do um, we could either do new s equals get next state s or we could add it as a new structure array. Okay. So I'm calculating the next state, which is going to be a structure that contains the transfer and the concentrations, and the concentrations are going to be the new concentrations. Now there is one thing I'm missing here. Um, I'm calculating a new value for the concentrations, uh, but the new S structure does not contain uh, the transfer matrix. So let's just initialize it to be the S itself. And the only thing that will change in the new S variable is the concentrations that we update here. <coughs> After that, we're going to plot it. So let's plot um, the time points uh, 1 to 10. Actually, 1 to 11 because there's one extra. And then we'll collect the concentrations of A from S. That's going to be a little tricky. Um, let's introduce a new variable called history equals S dot concentrations to collect the concentrations in a history matrix. So I have a structure array that has the concentrations for the first time point in, in a structure, in the first structure, second time point in the second structure, and so on. I'm collecting all of those concentrations into a single matrix and calling that history. And the rest is the same. Um, sorry, we'll do the first row. <coughs> and the second row. Let's hit F5 to run the entire thing. We get an error uh, saying that this one was closed with an END. Let's get rid of it. Hit F5 again. We get another variable, um, another error. History previously appeared here. Um, we no longer have this n variable, so let's get rid of that too. Actually, we need to move it into here. Or 
we can get rid of it entirely and replicate this um, as the number of elements in S dot concentrations. One more error. Um, patience. We got one more error. What does it say? Um, RepMath, too many input arguments. Um, so now, um, as we are building this structure array S, in the second iteration of this for loop, S is no longer a single structure, right? We decided that we are building up S and adding each new state as a new element in this structure array. So when we are calling the next state function, we should only be providing the last one of those. So S sub T is going to be the last state, and the result is going to be stored in the next state. Let's hit F5 again, and we get our plot. Um, let's delete the plot to make sure that it's being drawn by this function, and you get the same result. Okay? All right, any questions? Okay, so um, let's add a few more uh, features to this. Uh, let's provide S as the input and provide a, a, a parameter named delta t, which will be the time step in each iteration. So what we did so far was to have the time step to be equal to one. So we did the simulation at one time point and time equals two and so on. This delta t variable, um, if it's not equal to one, then it's going, going to change the time step of the simulation. So let's say when delta t equals uh, five, we will start from time zero and we will jump to time equals five. So time equals five is going to be our next state. We're going, we're, we are going to skip all the times in between. Or you could have a fractional delta t, let's say 0.5. In that case, we'll, we'll have time equals zero, and the next time point we are going to consider is time equals 0.5, and the next one is going to be point, uh, 1, and so on. Okay? All right. So if S is not provided, let's initialize it ourselves just to um, simplify testing this function so I don't have to go back to the command window every time I want to run it. Similarly, if delta t is not provided, let's set it to be 1. Now, where does this delta t go into? Um, we have to pass it to this uh, get next state function because the get next state um, works with these ratios, the amount of uh, metabolite being transferred. So if 0.5 is being transferred at one minute, we'll assume that um, 0.25, which is half of 0.5, would be transferred at delta t, delta t equals 0.5. So we need to multiply delta t with the transfer matrix. Does that make sense? Yes? All right, so up to now we considered delta t to be equal to one, uh, which was uh, calculating um, the concentrations at time equals one minute from the concentrations that were at time equals zero. And then we were calculating the concentrations at time equals two minutes from the concentrations that we had at time equals one minute. But we want to change that uh, time step of the simulation. We'll count, so when delta t equals 0.5, what we'll do is we'll pick uh, start from time equals zero, 
and calculate uh, what the concentrations will be at 30 seconds, at half a minute. Okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, that's, uh, why, why that would make a difference sometimes. Um, so where would this go, the delta T? It changes how much being transferred um, at that delta T amount of time. If you have 0.5 transferred in one minute, then you would have 0.5 times half a minute transferred in half a minute. Make sense? So all we have to do is multiply this uh, S dot transfer or the entire thing um, with delta T. So this expression right here tells me how much would be transferred in one minute. If delta T if delta T is a different value, then it will just be a multiplicative factor uh, that gives me how much would be transferred in that amount of time. So if X is being transferred in one minute, uh, delta T times X would be transferred in delta T uh, minutes. All right, so that's all I have to do except um, this. I have to pass delta T to that function. Let's rerun it. We get the same result. Uh, let's change delta t to be uh, 5. Rerun it, and you get that. When time step is too large, the system um, acts uh, sort of unstable. It acts weird, right? Uh, because your transfer <coughs> then becomes larger than how much, how much you actually have. So let's say uh, you have 0.5 being transferred in one minute. If your time step is um, 100 minutes, then you would be transferring 0.5 times 100, uh, 10 times the amount of uh, the concentration that you currently have, which is going to take you below zero. So your concentration will go below zero if your time step is too large. There's a question? Yes, yeah, I'm getting an error that says the function um, get next week's written to the uh, is written what? It's telling me that my get next state is working for structures. Get uh, next state is not working for structures. Uh, it may mean that you don't have this. This function get next state is not accessible at this point, meaning it's not defined. Um, you could either define it in the same file or define it in a separate file. Let's say edit get next state. Then we'll just copy and paste this portion here. Okay. Now I have two files. Um, one of them is going to call the other one. If a function is, is a small function, uh, just a few lines of code, and it's not going to be uh, used elsewhere, it's only going to be utilized inside this file, um, then it makes more sense to just um, include it at the end of it. Okay? So you don't need a separate uh, file for a, for a function that you're not going to be using uh, at other places. Okay. Let me just move it back. All right. So we, we can take a look at... Um, uh, did you solve the problem or no? We'll take a look at it. Uh, maybe one of the TAs can walk over and, and see what the problem is. All right. Yep. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, okay. So we need to be able to change the time step. And the smaller the time step, the better. Um, if we have a very small time step, then we will we are sort of ensuring that these instabilities will never occur, uh, meaning we will never go below zero for, for a concentration. Another way to sort of safeguard against concentrations that are below zero is the following. Um, so if a transfer is gives you less than what you already have, then you will just set it to zero. New start concentrations equals um, 
or here we do it here. Um, let's change the transfer vector. So the transfer vector will will tell me how much is moving away from each concentration, right? And it should be less than what I already had. So this is a matrix. The first row should be less than the concentration of A. The second row, each number should be less than the concentration of B. So I will do min, replicate this again. Trend. So that way, if I have, uh, let's say, 700 in A, I'm ensuring that uh, the maximum that I am taking from A is going to be 700. I'm taking the minimum of these two matrices. This one, which is the replicated of uh, the concentrations, and the second one is the transfer, the amounts being transferred. Let's hit F5 again. Um, no, I never go below zero. But it's still going to oscillate because the time step is too large. If you make the time step too small, that's going to give you a better, um, a better result, but you are not getting as much uh, along the way in terms of the um, number of Inter your simulation does not go fast enough for you to see any effect. One way to solve that is to make the maximum number of time step uh, to be not the number of iterations, but the number of, let's say, minutes. Okay, so let's make this iteration go 10 minutes. So I'll divide this by delta t. And I have to sort of change this 11 to be the size of history two. That way it always works regardless of how many time steps I have. All right, so if delta t is 0.1, I'm going to go 100 iterations. If delta t is 0 0.01, then I'm going to go um, 1,000 iterations. Let's hit F5. And we're going to have to wait a long time because the time, <coughs> because the time step is too small. Right? So that's the other um, that's the other trade-off. If your time step is too large, you get unstable results. When your time step is too small, your simulation runs a long time and you have to wait a long time to get results. So we have to find a happy medium that will give us stable results and take um, a reasonable amount of time. Um, MATLAB is not responding. I'll just have to give up on okay, it came back. Control C will cancel uh, the current operation if you are lucky. If you are not, um, you may you might have to terminate MATLAB. All right, let me just start up any MATLAB. Any questions so far? Let's keep it at point one by default. Okay, so we know we get a nice smooth graph. Um, the time step also affects how smooth your graph is. So let's do it for delta t equals two. You see that jaggedy um, plot? Let's reduce it to one. It's going to be smoother. And point one, then you won't see those breaks in your lines. Okay? All right, so that's the idea in simulation. You take uh, initial values. Uh, you have a function or um, a transfer function that tells you how much is being transferred from one uh, entity to another. You start from time equals zero. You iterate uh, over many time steps until things don't change anymore. 
right? And you'll, you'll see more of, the, more of these examples in biosimulations course. So I'm going to finish this up also and go back to the problem and see what additional things are different there.